Hello, I am Dr. Ahmed Abdelal, and this is a follow-up on the nature of sound part three on resonance. Unfortunately, the previous video ended because of time limitations ended before I completed the, uh, the presentation. So I am gonna skip to the, uh, the slide where the previous video ended. And then at the end, you're gonna also find the kind of a study guide that augments or complements the written study guide that is posted for you on Blackboard. So this is where we spoke, started speaking about kinds of filters. I just want to make sure this is clear. So we said that a tube, a tube or a, especially we focus our discussion on quarter wave resonator and the, the, the resonator that is closed on one end and the vocal tract is a resonator that is closed on one end and the source is, the sound is going to travel only one way. So the um, kinds of filters including many of the manufacturers and you know ones and so on for different purposes they include a low pass filter we discussed the uh, bandwidth we said that the on either side of the bandwidth and the lower frequency side after the lower frequency cutoff and on the other side the upper frequency cutoff beyond these points the the um, uh, tones are going to be rejected so <clears throat> anything that falls comes within the uh, wavelength here between this green line and this green line will be amplified will be enhanced anything on the other sides will be rejected so but the these filters the kinds of filters now um uh, there are different kind each one is going to to behave differently than the one that you are seeing here so uh sorry the thing is slow so here that is going to allow or to amplify frequencies that are lower that fall below the lower cutoff okay so instead of the normal kind of wave that pyramid shape the after the lower cutoff when it is not supposed to be amplifying it will that filter particular to make it amplify lower frequencies beyond below the lower cutoff the opposite one is the high pass filter which um, allows it keeps the same configuration uh, of the loop the amplified however it will allow any frequency beyond the upper cutoff all anything that is higher than the upper cutoff is going to be amplified as well like here and each one of course is going to serve a particular purpose and then we have the band pass filter the band is the bandwidth so it basically takes what is in the bandwidth and focuses more on that and then it it just takes out what is on either side and it enhances that, that is amplified within the band so it will look like this so this is how the vocal tract works this is the book eliminates a lot of the opposing forces and noises and so on and it enhances that bandwidth um, and it will make uh, it will amplify the sound optimally otherwise if this is not happening without this you are going to find that by the time the vocal fold buds got, gets out you know it is made exit to your lips because of all the resistance from the tissue and all of this so it will uh, the purpose of the amplification in the vocal tract is going to enable the sound or that buzz from the vocal folds to continue 
to be generated and to be enhanced significantly. So in the end, by the time the sound leaves the lips, it will have not lost, uh, it will have made up for the, all the damping that happens along the vocal tract. Then the band stop filter is a filter that basically deletes the bandwidth, takes the bandwidth, the most important part, out, and it leaves all the other areas to be in, to be amplified. Okay, the, the below the cut, uh, anything above that will be amplified. Anything below the lower cutoff will be amplified. The band it, with itself, anything falling in between, it will be uh, rejected. And again, this is for different purposes. Uh, each one serves particular uh, purposes. So now we're going to speak about resonance of the vocal tract, the human vocal tract. Think about it as a tube. That is, but it's a more complex tube. So here it is. The human vocal tract consists of a vertical tube that is known as the vocal, the, the, um, that is known as the pharynx. The part that is right above the vocal folds is called the hypopharynx or the laryngopharynx. The part that is across from the oral cavity is called the oropharynx. And the part that is across from the back of, I mean, uh, on the back of the nasal cavity is called the nasopharynx. When you add uh, two words, one ends in an L to another word coming after you make a word out of these two, typically the L changes into an O. Instead of oral motor, it becomes oromotor. Nasal pharynx, nasopharynx, oro pharynx. Okay. So that is a tube. It has its own resonance, resonant frequency by itself, naturally. Then we have the oral cavity. That's another tube that also has its own frequency, resonant frequency. The nasal cavity is a third one. It also has its own resonant frequency. When you combine all these three tubes, they give you more variety of tones that the vocal tract can amplify. More resonant frequency, resonance frequencies, uh, are, resonant frequencies are going to be generated. The vocal tract can generate um, up to 40 formats, 40 resonant frequencies that it will actually amplify. So that makes it a broadly band resonator. And again, remember, a broadly band resonator is more irregular in shape. And, and um, it, it gives you more of a variety of tones that can be amplified. It's like having, making a tube like this, and say, make that tube in a way broadly band. For example, that if you have 40 different people, they will uh, make tones into the tube. The tube is going to respond one way or another. Um, but again, I mean, the comparison is not the best because this is a narrowly tuned resonator because it's a cylinder, but the, the oral cavity is an irregular, irregular in shape and it has three tubes combined together that gives it a, a great uh, potential to amplify various tones. So then, the, um, know the values. How long is the vocal tract for a child, for an adult female, for an adult male? Uh, because length is going to be important in determining the resonant frequency of uh, each person. Because all of us have different lengths. Uh, our vocal tracts are not the same length. When we speak about averages, that applies to everyone. But um, we need to keep in mind, in order to, say, figure out my resonant frequency, you have to know how long my vocal tract is from the vocal fold, above the vocal folds to the lips. So, the vo again, I explained this, I don't need to, uh, but I want to say that how the vocal tract is measured, I mean, the resonance uh, measured in the vocal tract, 
The only way to measure it is to produce a sound. So when you make a sound at the end of that tube, that sound is going to tell you the neutral. You ideally want to know when it is neutral, but again, we can't, if you are, you know, sitting like this, you, you can't measure it unless you put a tone into it. And the only way you put a tone into it is by the vocal folds. So the smallest sound, the smallest English sound, that gives us the smallest uh, kind of sound that is close to rest, as if you are not even making any sound, is the schwa sound. So that schwa sound is in, found in words like alone, uh, alone, above, ab uh, above, above. Uh, so that is the schwa, called the schwa. And it has a symbol like this. And you study it in phonetics. So the schwa is used as a way to measure or test the frequency of the vocal, resonant frequency of the vocal. I'm sorry, the vocal tract. <coughs> so, the vocal tract as a filter is going to skip, is going to amplify the odd numbers and it will attenuate the even numbers. <coughs> so, then, it behaves like a quarter, like a tube that is closed on one end, exactly. That means the first time that the vocal tract is going to re respond to a tone is when that tone, the wavelength of that tone, is four times the length of the vocal tract. <coughs> so now, let's take, hmm, let's recall the harmonics series. Harmonics are, the, the vocal tract makes harmonics because there are, there is air. There's the tone that comes from the vocal folds. And this tone is made and immediately now, the air in the vocal tract starts to, is going to vibrate, but it will either amplify or attenuate. So that tone is going to continue playing like the swing. You lift it, let go, and it continues to swing several times until it stops. So this is what happens. So the, the sound wave is going to continue to be generated but when it comes close enough to match the fre natural frequency or the natural resonant frequency of the vocal fold, of the vocal tract, then the vocal tract will pick up the signal and will amplify it. If, as the, the tone continues to, to play again, if it comes to one time it plays and it doesn't match the resonant frequency of the vocal tract, it will be rejected. It will fall, it will fall below or above the bandwidth of the vocal tract. So in effect, the vocal tract is going, to, once it begins to respond, say at 500, for example. So my vocal folds are, as a male, Let's say they make 115 hertz vibrations per second. Make the number even so it will make it easier for you. Let's say 100. So now that 100 is going to say, if I say, ah, that 100 hertz tone is going to now make the air vibrate. I mean, yeah, vibrate. So the first vibration in the air is going to make the tone 200 hertz. The third vibration will make the tone 300 hertz. Now the vocal track is 500, so it doesn't care. And then 400, it doesn't. And then 500, the tone now reaches, and the fifth time it is echoed, 500 hertz. 
then it matches the config it matches the resonant frequency of the vocal tract and then the vocal tract will buzz it will amplify that tone and it will have the greatest amplification because it is exactly 500 it matches exactly so now we once we reach that 500 we say okay that is the most important thing because this is where we know the resonant frequency of the vocal tract we have known it now the vocal fold frequency now we do not use it now anymore in the calculation in that harmonic series in that case we use the first time that the vocal tract resonates in response so we start our calculations from the first harmonic of the vocal tract the 500 <clears throat> so in that case that first harmonic we call it because that is when the vocal tract actually gives me a response we call it the first formant f1 and then the natural frequency or the fundamental frequency that has to do with the vocal folds now we we just that doesn't help us in calculating the resonant frequency we just leave that aside and the first time that the vocal tract itself begins to resonate in response to that original tone then i say this is my base this is my first uh, frequency that i'm going to determine um, used to determine in you know, other uh, frequencies so the f1 here will be the 500 that, that the vocal uh, tract response at so now the we know that this is the first response how long is the wave for this response how long is the the wave of the vocal tract i mean you say how do i know well if i say now to you that the vocal tract this particular vocal tract is 17 centimeters if you have this number you will be able to figure out everything else a single number how long is that tube how long is the vocal tract from the vocal folds to the lips so oh, 17 which is the average for males so 17 centimeters we said earlier that the a quarter wave resonator at first when it begins to respond only a quarter of the wave will fit because the wave is at the longest is at its longest and the first time it is made so then everything will go from there becomes higher and higher and that means the wave is going to be shorter and shorter so now 500 is the starting the first frequency we say r1 and then the second frequency that would come normally that you would expect it would be 1000 so i call it r2 resonant frequency num i mean uh, uh, resonance number two but i <clears throat> we just give it that number and see what happens and then the third line after so so here we have f1 or the r1 and the second one is we just don't say f we should just say r resonance number um two and then the third line after that resonance number uh, three and then four five let's say up to five you can go more i'm just giving you examples so now the vocal track is going to say okay i am i have amplified this tone when it reached 500 hertz that will be the loudest tone then when it comes to the 200 uh, 1000 i mean the vocal tract will not respond it will not um, accept it so that will be attenuated the 1000 is an even number so r1 then r2 2 is even so it will delete it then r3 that will be the second time the vocal tract is gonna amplify 
So R3 becomes the second formant. The formant is the response of the vocal tract. And the th first three formants are the loudest, the most important. And you can add the fourth one as well. Among the 40 resonant frequencies that the vocal tracks, uh, vocal tract makes 40 formants, but the first three are the most critical ones. And the fourth one is also important in, in, in vowel when you study vowels. So the vocal tract eliminates the even numbers. So you number all the frequencies from one, from R1, and you keep going every second, every even one. So to 1000 will be eliminated. And then you have 1500, it is amplified. 2000 eliminated, 2500 amplified, 3000 eliminated. And you keep going on, on every even frequency will be deleted. Every odd one will stay. And the odd ones are similar to each other more. And they are going to enhance. They will produce together. They combine to make the sound significantly louder. This way, as the sound travels from the vocal folds, it doesn't, you make up for the energy that is lost because of the damping of the tissue and the absorption and all of this that takes place inside of the vocal tract. So now you have determined the length of the vocal tract. We know that we want to calculate the frequency, the resonant frequency of the vocal tract. So the equation goes like this. Um, F which is the frequency, resonant frequency here, F equals the sound speed constant, the speed of sound or the constant speed of sound divided by the length of the wave. That is your equation. C or sound const uh, speed constant divided by lambda. So now you learned before that the sound constant is 3,331 meters per second at sea level at freezing temperature. But now we are speaking about, you know, the vocal tract and the sound traveling through the vocal tract, traveling in, um, you know, medium, in a medium that is different than, tem you know, freezing and all of this. So that the, after you do all the calculations, the speed of sound in the vocal tract is going to come to three, I mean, um, uh, 340 meters per second. However, it doesn't make sense to divide 340 meters in meters. You can't divide by centimeters. You have to convert the meters to centimeters. This is why you recall that a meter is 100 centimeters. So that means to convert 30, 340 meters into centimeters, you have to add two zeros. So this is where you have 34,000 centimeters per second. That is the constant speed of sound along the vocal tract and divide by the length of the wave, we said one quarter fits at the first time the wave is played. And that means that the wave is four times that length. That means four times 17 is 68. Now you need to understand this really well and look at the book and read so that you know how to answer several questions like this. So the first resonant resonance for the vocal tract, the first time it responds, is the, the product of this. 34,000 divided by 68 centimeters equals 500. I gave you this as an even number to make, but it's not always even. So then that also becomes the first formant or the first response of the vocal folds, then the tone again at 1000 will be rejected 
and then 1500 becomes um, amplified and that becomes our second formant and then uh, the fourth vibration becomes attenuated the fifth vibration r5 it becomes f3 that is the second the third formant and then the sixth vibration because it's an even number it is deleted and the seventh becomes r3 so um you need to work on this one solve this one using the case we just discussed determine f2 f3 f4 f5 f6 yes i told you f beyond f4 it's not significant but i want you to learn how to cal how to identify these and how to exactly give me the exact number you are going to have substantial questions that ask you about these uh, you know how to solve these problems so remember that even numbered multiples yield opposing forces while the odd ones that we call formants the odd ones are going to stay and will increase the sound intensity four months or the responses of the vocal tract the times that it will amplify they are determined by three things they are determined by number one the diameter of the vocal tract the the wider the diameter is the lower the pitch so you remember volume is inversely related to uh, frequency that this um, the narrower the vocal tract is the or like any any pipe the the higher the frequency the vocal tract adjusts all the time then the length of the vocal tract the longer the vocal tract is the greater the distances from the vocal folds to the oral cavity the lower the resonant frequency and the shorter vocal tract will make uh, higher pitches higher resonant frequencies so let me see if the same person can change the configuration of the vocal tract make it um, longer or shorter so for example i am here now a neutral vocal tract so but i can make it longer if i go ooh, ooh, i extend my lips close to three quarters of an inch so that is going to make the vocal tract longer and it will make the pitch lower if i say e so the distance between neutral and e is about a half a centimeter and that's going to bring the lips back and it will shorten the vocal tract imagine the distance between o and e that's quite a big distance so you can adjust the length of the vocal tract in different ways you can adjust the diameter of the vocal tract moreover the vocal tract itself is influenced by the by the um, the jaw if the jaw is uh, bigger you make a sound that has a bigger opening say when you say e you notice there's little very the, the jaw is really it's like closed e but when you say ah ah that makes the jaw bigger so that is going to affect it gives you more room here and that makes the frequency here in the front of lower cavity for a ah, it will make it lower the opposite for e the tongue is going to also affect the configuration and it will affect the resonant frequency uh, simply because of the play between volume the amount of space available amount of air available and the um, frequency so again the whenever you create a bigger space then that means the sound the air molecules will travel far distances that will make the pitch lower the frequency lower and the opposite is true the velum the velum 
if it, it goes lower in the oral cavity, it will constrict, it will cause the pitch to be higher. If it goes high up, it will make the pitch also change to make it lower. Uh, the mandible, we said that the lips, as we said, if you round your lips and extend them forward, that will lower the pitch. So a lot of things happen at once. The tongue, when you say E, goes forward and it goes up. So it leaves a big space in the back in the hypopharynx. That makes the frequency here lower and it makes the fre resonant frequency in the front, it makes it higher. So this is what the three, four months, we focus on the three because they are the most important ones because they are the loudest ones and they determine every, basically what you hear uh, for the most part. So R1 is the 500 that we discussed. That is resonance number one. R2 is deleted. Then R3 and then R4 is deleted. R5. So we just simply call this R resonance number one, resonance two, and stuff like that, just for the sake of calculation. But we know that the vocal tract, it has responded now with R1. So we call this F1. We know it has responded, the second response that it makes is R3, that is F2. And then the fifth response, we know this is the third time the vocal tract is amplifying is F, uh, is F3. And you can figure out all the other ones. So now with F1, um, the first time the wave plays, it, one quarter of the wave fits, one quarter fits. And that means the wave is quite big. The longest that it can be is, is with this. So the whole entire vocal tract is engaged, symmetrical here, engaged. And the tone buzzes throughout the entire here, but it is the biggest that you can determine it by examining the activity of the air in the lower pharynx. So you want to know where F1 is, it is in the hypopharynx, the lower part of the pharynx, F1. F2 can be localized from the tongue tip, between the tongue tip and the alveolar ridge, right in this space here. F3 can be localized between the dorsum of the tongue and the velum. This is close to when you say kahanga, kahanga, here, F3. <clears throat> you can see here. So now we, you need to know that um, air pressure is related also to the frequency. You need to know that, um, you, you know, each, in each case, for example, the first one, there's one point of maximum pressure at the right above the vocal folds and the maximum velocity is at the lips. The air just is released at the fastest point. And then as more of the wave fits in three quarters now, you have two points of pressure, two points of velocity. They are located in specific parts of the vocal tract. When you look here, you are going to have, <clears throat> because you have now the frequency becomes higher every time. So you have five quarters of the wave, one full wave and one quarter. So it becomes like this three points of pressure, maximum pressure, three points of maximum velocity. Now, each one of these uh, formats will be influenced by something that could happen. F1 is going to be sensitive to, or will be changed, or you know, may different differ um, uh, based on lip position. That can, like if you constrict your lips, say p, b, e, uh, or u, um, if you constrict your lips or protrude them, it is also inversely related to the position of the tongue. Uh, in terms of tongue height, is the tongue high or low? So we said F1 is here, localized here. 
When I say e, the tongue go, goes forward and it rises in the oral cavity. So that means it leaves a wide gap in the hypopharynx, creates more room, bigger volume. That makes F1 for E as in feet. It makes it lower, like 300 hertz. Now F2, the tongue now is forward and high. It doesn't, it leaves less room in the front. So E, F2 here for E is 2,200 something or 2,300, something like that. So it, everything now, I mean, F1 will be sensitive to these changes that make the tongue go up or, uh, or go down or stay in the middle. And we classify the vowels in phonetics. We, we, we describe a vowel based on how high the tongue or how low or the advancement also. But just know what each formant is affected by. F2, we said it is here and between the alveolar ridge and the tongue tip, the front of the tongue. And it is most sensitive to the length of the oral cavity, not the whole, but the length of the oral cavity from the lips to the pharynx. And also it is sensitive to tongue advancement. advancement. So if the tongue goes forward or stays in the middle or goes back, that will be affected uh, by tongue advancement and the length of the oral cavity. The F3 can be modified or changed <coughs> um, based, on the mo uh, based on front to back constriction, like any time the pharynx constricts or becomes bigger, or any time the vocal, the vocal uh, oral cavity becomes wider, like dropping the jaw or bringing it up, that is going to affect the uh, frequency value of the second, the third form. So you know what each one is like, where it is localized, and what it is sensitive to. What can make it change? So, for example. Uh, resonant frequencies change when the vocal tract is constricted near a point of maximum velocity or maximum pressure. So we said oh, these are all these points here, maximum velocity, maximum pressure. The, the frequencies can change if you narrow the vocal tract at this point. That will change the values that you will get. So constrictions at maximum velocity points is going to make the frequency lower, okay? Constrictions at points of maximum speed of air will make the frequency lower. <clears throat> so, for example, when there's a point here, velocity, at the lips, when you constrict and protrude your lips and say, ooh, that is going to make um, uh, F2 lower. F2 is going to be lower. Uh, constriction at the uh, point of maximum pressure, uh, like at the alveolar ridge, for example, or at the uh, near the velum and the tongue here, or lower at the vocal folds, that is going to make um, uh, uh, the, the, the resonant frequency at that point higher, higher. And then it's like when you, for example, uh, make a constriction in the lower pharynx, uh, for example, like this, I'm going to show you. This thing is a bit slow. All right. Uh, okay. So I'll show you. <clears throat> uh, as an example, we are going to look at the, the four months, every vowel. We examine it and say, how are the four months? One, two, three. But in science, like speech and hearing science, when you study the vowels, you are also at the, the fourth format. But for now, for our purposes, three are enough. So wh what are the first, second, and third formants for ah, ah, as in actually, <clears throat> I'm sorry, okay, make this, um, make this ah, as in pot or cod, cod. I'm going to change that. 
what is the how is the first four months second and third for e for example so let's look first let's take e this is how and the the the, the four months are represented uh, at the beginning this is where you find the response for, for F1 for E. In the vocal tract itself, the hypopharynx, you see this dotted line is where the tongue is supposed to be originally. So what happens is when you say E, the tongue goes forward at the same time goes up and it leaves a big space here uh, in the hypopharynx. That is, is where um, F1 is determined. So that makes F1 lower. And you could see F1 here for E is about 300, about 300 hertz. So now then, um, what about F2, what about F3? So because there's a great constriction in the front for E, there's not much room for the air to resonate. Then the, 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 that vocal tract doesn't respond, doesn't respond, doesn't respond because that narrow space is gonna require a higher, much higher frequency. So you go to even 2,550 Hertz, when that tone reaches that, uh, that is gonna make this area buzz, the, this um, little area. So that is where F2 is. So because of the constriction in space. F3, because there's also a constriction that is affecting the location for F3, there is not much volume, then that's going to make F3 occur right after. Uh, you could see because we are dealing with living tissue, all these changes are happening. We cannot really predict where each sound is going to be until we measure it with instruments, a speech sound analysis and instrument like busy pitch or sound analysis uh, systems. So we need to understand how this is related to the tongue position, height and advancement, and how you can plot this. Uh, so that shows the attenuation rates, the, the areas that were deleted here uh, for E and the, the four months as they occur, the responses for F1 comes here and skip, 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 attenuate all of this and come and respond again at 20, uh, to 2550 and then skip and then come back again at 3000. So we use <clears throat> a chart called the spectrogram to plot the four months. A four month basically is that dark band that if you look at it carefully under a microscope, under like amplification, it will show all the points of compression and you know that are in, in that tone. And it shows this time is in minutes or seconds. They say e for a number of minutes, and then that continues to go. All the peaks from that wave are cons are here to show the energy. So the lowest formant comes in the bottom. So for this frequent for this spectrogram, you have the frequencies plotted in the ax vertical in the. Um, in the vertical axis in, in thousands. So you have zero, that is rest, and then uh, 500, 1000, uh, 1500, 2000, and so on. It could go up to, you know, seven or 8000. So the first frequency emerges in the bottom, the first one in the bottom as a dark, solidly dark band. And that will show, for example, here that F1, the first response of the vocal tract, here for this area is three, at 300 hertz. And the second format, skip, 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 and go way up. It's gonna show up at 2,500 plus. It will be here immediately after the fourth format is gonna, I mean, the third format is gonna come above. So this is, these are the formats. And this will show you um, how the attenuation rates uh, go, how the vocal tract serves as a filter and we'll discuss this uh, a little bit more later so and this is, has to do with the length of the vocal tract and, um, and so this is the configuration for e uh, low frequency for f1 high frequency for f2 high frequency for f3
because all because of the tongue position. So let's take ah as in jar, ah. That is the symbol that we use for, for that sound. So what happens when you say ah? You need to remember to know how to describe each of these sounds. For example, that I'm giving you e, ah, u. So here the tongue has, there's a muscle that connects the tongue to the uh, uh, cricoid. Uh, no, I'm sorry, to the hyoid bone, hyoid bone. That muscle is called the high, it actually originates on the hyoid. It inserts onto the lower two thirds of the tongue. We call this the hyoglossus, hyoglossus muscle, hyoid glossum, uh, glossus, hyoglossus. So the hyoglossus muscle, to make the sound ah, it's going to hold the tongue in two directions. You see the angle, it's at, it's at an angle, like oblique angle. So when it pulls the tongue, it contracts, it pulls the tongue down, down and back. So in effect, that is going to constrict the hypopharynx, it will make it less, less room. But what we we'll do is to make greater room um, for F1, F2 and F3. And in addition to that, that is even made more, uh, lower because the, the jaw itself goes down. So we have restricted hypopharynx. We have a much wider oral um, space and volume in the oral cavity uh, where F2 would be and F3. That gives us low, uh, uh, higher pitch for F1 and lower pitch for F2 and 3. So you know, I need to know how, why this is different how this works exactly and ex explain it with reference to the space, with reference to the volume in each spot and with reference to the position of the tongue and the action of the hyoglossus because it pulls the tongue down and back. What happens for U? <coughs> U is characterized by a long vocal tract. The, the lips protrude and go down, out and are constricted as well. All of this will contribute to making the OO uh, quite interesting. So in OO, you need the styloglossus muscle, left and right, to pull the tongue up and back, just like this. So it did two things. It constricted the hypopharynx. Then you say, well, I should have lower frequency, a higher frequency here for F1, but that's not the case. That is, becomes kind of something else cancels that rule. And then the tongue rises to the highest point and the far, farthest point in the back. So let's see what it leaves out. It's going to leave out all of this room in the front. So you know that F2 is going to be significantly low, low. And F3 is going to be uh, even uh, also um, to some extent. But the most important thing is that the front is wide open and that's going to give us low F2. But how about F1? Why is it 300? Why is it still low, even though there's a constriction in the back? The rule of elongating the tube cancels out that because it makes the journey that the air molecules take, it makes it very long. From here, the way you measure, if you get a, a thread and, and go and measure it from here to here, it's going to go all above this mountain and all the way and then go from here to here. That is going to make that um, the length of the tube significantly longer and that is going to make F1 uh, uh, lower even though there's a constriction in the back. And this is why F1 is 300. So that basically you know, explains this and there are some rules. These are physical rules that you need to understand, you need to really know. <clears throat> so the one 
is that the longer the oral cavity is, the lower the fundamental, the, the lower the resonant frequency is going to be. Uh, tongue backing, you back the tongue as you say ah, or lip rounding is going to make F2 lower as we said in ah, because the constriction occurs at a point of, of uh, high velocity. Tongue or jaw activity that narrows, that narrows the area of high pressure will raise uh, F, uh, will raise the frequency. As we see, for example, in uh, E, you make the, the lips are retracted and also the tongue rises and goes forward. And then also, you are gonna, um, uh, long oral cavity is going to lower F2, uh, the second format, as when you say U. So now we're going to speak about uh, something called the source filter theory. Um, it, it is basically explains it, it explains to us how the vocal tract serves as a filter and how the buzz from the vocal folds becomes the source, the source of the tone, the raw material that the vocal folds make with their fundamental frequency. Okay, so the source here is the buzz that comes from the vocal folds. Now that buzz travels through the vocal tract and it will be modified, it will be altered in different ways by the resonant frequency or frequencies of the vocal tract, how it is shaped, how it is configured, how it behaves. So the filter is the vocal tract itself because remember it attenuates and it rejects and it filters out the even numbers and so on so in, in the end um, the vocal tract as a filter uh, is going to enable us to to produce the harmonics or the resonant frequencies we call formants and um these formants will enable that buzz to be amplified at the highest point when that buzz comes close to the resonant frequency of the particular locations of the vocal tract for F1, F2, and F3. So in effect, the three formants and all the formants that actually occur that we don't we haven't been measuring up to 40 of them they play together and they together combine and the result is and also in the meantime they combine with the original source of the fundamental frequency so what you have at the end of the lips is the sound that is an outcome of everything all these four months together uh, it's an outcome of both the source tone and the filtered tone. So if you take the vocal folds and treat them as you treat uh, just as a mechanical uh, thing moving, uh, like the guitar string itself, it should be going like this. Say if my fundamental frequency is say 100, the vocal uh, tract is going to give you the second time the vocal fold will will vibrate, it's going to be uh, 200, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it will not skip anything. That's the vocal fold. As it continues to vibrate, it will uh, produce harmonics without skipping anything. Like the, the video that you have where the guy shows the, you know, explains the harmonics. That's how the vocal folds vibrate, just like a guitar string, like a rubber band. To just pieces of tissue that vibrate and they don't filter out. Now you take that buzz that is made and you enter it into the vocal tract. The vocal tract will go and say, okay, I'm going to delete anything that is here. I'm going to delete anything that's here, anything that's here, because that doesn't agree with me. So it will respond at 500, then it will respond at second format 1500, and then to 2500. The, so it will be like this. Now take this and overlay it on this. So this is the vocal tract, tract 
uh, activity filtering overlaid on this, and that will show you this. So now you have both the source tone, you can see from the vocal folds, and then you can see what is taken out, attenuated, and what is left, attenuated, left. So this is a combination that tells us what source filter theory is about. It's that the, the, the sound that we get at the lips is the product of the source tone from the vocal folds uh, combined with the, um, the modifications made uh, by the vocal tract. And this is what you would get at the output. How do you make, <clears throat> uh, how do you prove that the source and the filter are different? How do you prove that the vocal folds behave in a different way from the filtering aspect? So, okay, we'll see. First one, we can maintain the, um, maintain cons consistent uh, pitch, fundamental frequency. Like we can keep the vocal folds vibrating at a steady rate, produce exactly the same fundamental frequency. And we'll see what happens if we change the configuration of the vocal folds while the tone, while the fundamental frequency is the same. So, first, that means we make a sound like say, e steadily, but then let's, as we are doing it, make a modification by our lips, for example. E So the same vibration rate from the vocal folds. Once we make a modification by changing labial position, the frequency is going to change. So it means that the vocal folds behave differently from the filter. However, they combine their output together. Now, um, we can also prove that the filter can behave independently from the vocal folds. How do we do that? We can um, <clears throat> keep the filter steady. I'm going to say, e I'm not going to change my labial position. I'm not going to change my jaw position, my tongue, nothing at all. But I'm going to change how the vocal folds are going to work. I'm going to make them tense to raise my pitch. And you see how that is going to, even though I, the filter is completely the same, the change on the fundamental frequency and the source, that is going to be possible. So I say, e So doing that, being able to modify one when I leave the other st steady unchanged, that proves that the source is different from the filter. However, we know that what it co comes at the lips, when you, what you hear is the outcome, the byproduct of what the original buzz is and the filtering from the vocal tract. So that brings us to the end. However, I'm going, to, you have the study guide. It has all the questions and all the things that you need to know. However, <clears throat> I started to make one uh, kind of after each video and it wasn't possible because of the, uh, the videos became uh, longer and I was timed out. So now I am gonna take it step by step, use the following uh, for part one and part two and part three. For part one, know the basic concepts, all the basic concepts, any definitions uh, or concepts like acoustics, what's acoustics, what's bioacoustics, uh, what is density, mass, force, all of these definitions that we discussed. <clears throat> know the definition of sound, what is a sound, how is the sound propagated, in a global fashion, you know, all around. Um, what is atmospheric pressure? Uh, what is the difference between laminar flow and turbulent flow? You are going to have a question like, for example, in your textbook says Brownian motion. What is that? I didn't discuss it here, but it's in your textbook. 
What type of sounds are generated by laminar flow in terms of vowels, for example? Give examples. Are you able to give me five vowels that are made by laminar flow? Any vowel is made by laminar flow. Turbulent pressure. Can you give me examples? Any consonant, basically. If I say name five consonants that are, or five sounds, five sounds that are made by turbulent flow, you should be able to name that. What about voiced sounds, voiceless sounds? Name a sound or, or five, five sounds that are made by a combination of periodic tones and aperiodic tones. That means I'm asking you about the voiced sounds that I detailed in the previous videos. What about uh, five sounds that are made by uh, a completely aperiodic? Uh, and that means all voiceless sounds. What is Boyle's law? How does it relate to respiration? Yes, we haven't discussed respiration, but we, <clears throat> we spoke about Boyle's law and we will relate it. But for that point, to the extent I discussed it in the video before, what is Boyle's law? You have to understand that when you speak about a natural law, it has to be word by word. If you leave the word enclosed out, if you say the law says this and this, but you don't say the word enclosed, that means that is not the law, it will not work. So the only way that the air is going to behave the way it does to, with the relationship between pressure and volume, the only way you describe it is when you are speaking about air enclosed in a closed container, just like I made. I do not make the mistake where you take the word enclosed out because that's going to make the, 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 the whole thing not work. What is compression? What is rarefaction? Um, what is elasticity, inertia, friction? How do these three things interact together to produce the oscillation or the wave? Uh, you need to know Hooke's law. What is Hooke's law? What does it say word by word? How does it help generate the cycle of vibration? Um, what is damping? What is amplitude? What is intensity? What is um, a sound wave exactly? Uh, how is a sound wave represented on a chart? What is the name of the, of the chart uh, or the, the, the graph that depicts a sound wave? What is a wave front? Uh, so what is wave form? What is the wave length? And you need to know how to, to determine, to answer questions, to determine the length of a wave. What is simple harmonic motion? Uh, give examples of things that, do, that produce simple harmonic motions. What is the single most important requirement for producing simple harmonic motion? Um, what is a cycle? What is a period? What is frequency? How are frequency, period, relate and period related. How is wavelength related to frequency? I'm speaking about this, like the greater the frequency, uh, the, 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 the greater the frequency, the, um, the, the lower the wavelength, and the greater the wavelength, the lower the frequency, and so on. Yeah, so understand they will have, you'll have many questions that ask, about you to calculate the relationship to find out frequency, find out uh, wavelength, find out uh, period. What is the difference between low frequency and high frequency sounds uh, in terms of how fast they travel, how far they travel? There's a trick here. How fast all sounds travel at the same speed, given the constant temperature. Uh, but they don't travel the same distance. Calculate wavelength, know the difference between periodic tones and aperiodic tones. There will be a big question on that. <clears throat> so that is for the first video, for the first lecture. The second one, um, you need part two. You need to know what happens when you combine two tones, 
whether these tones are periodic, what happens? What is the outcome? What happens if the two tones are aperiodic? What do you get? Um, does the does the pitch change when you when you add two periodic tones that are identical? Does it change when you, you add aperiodic tones? In what way? Be able to figure out uh, questions that have to do with uh, periodic and aperiodic tones when you combine them together. Like I have a periodic tone, I have a periodic tone, say of 100 hertz, and another tone that's 100, uh, two waves, and I combine them together, what do I get? So you need to know how to calculate this. I give you the loudness, I give you the amplitude for each. Uh, know the conditions that make uh, any sound periodic. Uh, what are harmonics? How are they displayed? What graph displays harmonics? What do you call it? How do you, do, how do you determine specific harmonics in a series? Like find the second harmonic, the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic. Uh, you need to uh, learn how to solve problems really of this kind. What, speeds, uh, what speech sounds are pure tones? Give me a number of speech sounds that are pure tones. Which ones are not pure tones? Give examples. Know the concepts, uh, any concept, for example, of absorption, reflection, re refraction, diffraction, interference and the concepts that we discussed, any concept that is there, I can't name them, but I just say, if it's a concept, if it's a definition, you need to understand it well and define it. Um, what is the relationship between frequency and pitch? A very simple question. They are the same thing, but pitch is what we perceive and frequency it is what we measure there with the machine. What is the decibel scale? What did it do exactly? What, how do we use it? What is the name of the um, a chart that is used by on, an audiologist to plot your hearing exam results? What do you call that? What is an incident wave? What is a reflected wave? What is the speed of sound, uh, constant speed of sound? generally, any sound. What is the constant speed of sound in the vocal tract? What is, uh, how the sound is affected by temperature? Does it go up, does it go down, to what extent? What exactly, if you increase by one centigrade, how fast or how slow will the sound be? Does air travel faster in cold water or in warm water? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cold, what, uh, what, what, cold air or warm air? Uh, know the equation for temperature and the speed of sound. So for three, section three, uh, or uh, yeah, the lecture number three, that's in, complemented by this video. Uh, speaking about resonance, know all the concepts and definitions about resonance, like applied frequency, driving frequency, uh, resonant frequency, and so on. What is a resonator? What is a mechanical resonator? Give an example. What is an acoustic resonator? Give an example. Uh, um, concepts uh, like node, antinode, etc., etc. I can't name all of these. The video will be so long. How does a quarter wave resonator behave? Exactly, what is the shape? How much of the uh, wave is gonna be fitting in the first time and the second and third and so on? What uh, frequencies will it um, uh, uh, you know, amplify and, and uh, reject? Basically, it will just take everything. It will go, like if you say 100, it will go um, 200, 3, 4, 5, and you keep going on. But the quarter wave resonator behaves differently. Differently. Figure out, be able to figure out the wavelength, uh, figure out resonant frequency uh, of a tube, know how long uh, the wave will be the first time the tube responds, given, you know, the tube is for uh, the first time, four 
I mean, one quarter of the wave fits in, that means four times four, that gives you the length. Know the equation well. Make sure that you use sound constant speed, sound speed constant that is different, that is for the vo vocal tract, 340 meters, make them into centimeters, 34,000 centimeters. If you make that mistake, you will, lose, you will lose many, many questions you will not be able to answer. You have to know the difference that we are speaking about living <coughs> beings and we, we, um, we are not speaking about any sound at, at sea temperature and freezing. No, the sound is in a living creature at different temperatures. So the sound constant is 30, uh, 340,000 uh, uh, centimeters per second. What is a standing wave? Uh, be able to figure out uh, R1, R2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, what is the difference between when you say R1, R2, R3, and so on, and F1, F2, F3, F4? What is the difference? What is bandwidth? Be able to answer, to solve problems involving bandwidth and uh, know the difference between uh, what is the cutoff, lower, upper cutoff, and the lower cutoff. What is, how do you take bandwidth and split it along the center? What is cutoff frequency? I'm sorry, central frequency. Compare narrowly tuned resonators with broadly tuned resonators. What is the difference? Um, what is the 3 dB, um, a three decibel uh, point? What is a resonance curve? What types of filters are there? Make sure to understand what each one is like and what each one does. Uh, what, what are the parts of the vocal tract? You need to know the three main parts, but for the pharynx, what are the different parts of the pharynx? Hypo, pharynx, oropharynx, nasopharynx. Um, what is, um, the, how is the length of the vocal tract related to the resonance of the vocal tract? How will it affect it? Will it make the resonance lower or higher? What is resonant frequency? What do you, what do you call uh, resonant frequency of the vocal tract? It, it, you call it formant. Determine F1, F2, F3, F4 of the vocal tract when you are given the length of, the, of a particular vocal tract. I could give you like say a child's vocal tract is 13 or 14 centimeters. What is the resonant frequency, resonant frequency of that vocal tract? I'll give you more questions like this on, on Blackboard. So know the equation or any equation that we have discussed and how to solve problems really using that equation. Know the characteristics and the locations of F1, F2, and F3. Um, what are the factors that will influence or, F or change F1? What are the factors that change F2? What are the factors that change F3? How are the formants uh, influenced by lip position, tongue position, jaw position, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, pharynx size, for example. Uh, no <coughs> formant values for F1, F2, F3 for the sounds E, as in feet, for the sounds A, and for the sound U. Know exactly why each one goes up or down, why each one is the way that it is, exactly as I explained it in this video. What is source filter theory? What is the source? What is filter? Uh, what does the theory tell us? How can you change the, how can you prove that the filter is separate from the, from the source? How do you, what are the two ways to test that? Um, like uh, keeping the filter, uh, changing the filter while keeping the source steady or by keeping the filter steady and changing the source. So that uh, basically serves as your guide for the all that unit 
from part one to part three. And again, you have a study guide uh, written that is posted and uh, you might find some of these items different, uh, a little bit adding to the study guide, but you should have everything that you need to do a fabulous job on your exam uh, that is coming up soon. So I hope that you listen to these uh, lectures more than once, take good notes and you can go back, uh, pause and, um, and review. And then we'll speak about in the coming units, we're gonna speak about respiration, phonation, uh, hearing and the nervous system. So thank you.